There's been a new study from Yale that looked at the effects of 51 supplements, pharmaceuticals and lifestyle interventions on epigenetic age scores in humans. Epigenetic age is based on DNA methylation and it's often interchangeably used with biological age or the proposed age of your biology, which is different from your chronological age, which is the age in your passport. So in this video, I'm going to look at the study to see which interventions resulted in the greatest reduction in epigenetic age. And I'll also discuss what does it mean because there's a lot of nuances and misconceptions about it. The study was authored by people from Yale in collaboration with True Diagnostics, which is an epigenetic age testing company. It's currently a preprint and not peer-reviewed, which means that the findings aren't confirmed yet by other scientists. What they did was look at 51 interventional studies and calculated the results based on 16 of the most popular epigenetic age clocks out there, along with 95 other DNA methylation biomarkers. I'm going to share with you what interventions they investigated, but it's important to realize that the field of biological age testing is still very new. So many of these clocks can give you different results. All right, so which interventions were the top performers? As you can see from this graph, the lower the black line, the greater the reduction in epigenetic age. The number one and two spot was for arthritis therapy and anti-TNF therapy. This involves pharmaceutical drugs for lowering inflammation in arthritis. Number three was metformin, which is a diabetes drug that lowers blood sugar and has also been seen to have anti-inflammatory effects. Number four was another anti-TNF therapy, which involves pharmaceutically suppressing TNF, which is a major inflammatory protein that the body uses to protect against infections and cancer. Chronically high inflammation leads to inflammatory diseases like arthritis, but I'm not convinced that chronically suppressing inflammation would be good either because you need inflammation for for proper immune system function. It's just that when it's too high and chronically elevated, that's when it becomes an issue. Number five is HBOT or hyperbaric oxygen therapy, specifically high pressure HBOT. It involves breathing pure oxygen in a pressurized environment and it's commonly used to heal from carbon monoxide poisoning, gangrene, and to promote wound healing. HBOT has anti-inflammatory effects and it's been seen to promote telomere growth. Next, we have AC11 supplementation, which is a patented botanical extract of cat's claw. Number seven and eight were high hyperbaric again, but mild pressure. Number nine was gastric bypass surgery, which is quite interesting, but it makes sense because you'll be losing weight and eating much less food. It's just not a pro-longevity strategy, but instead an anti-obesity intervention. The reduction in epigenetic age from gastric bypass probably comes from the weight loss. And of course, a regular healthy person wouldn't see those effects. Obesity is usually accompanied by higher biological age, and weight loss will reduce that. Number 10, senolytic supplements, tazatinib and quercetin. Senolytics are known to have anti-inflammatory effects and have been seen to reduce senescent cells in animals, which are these pro-inflammatory metabolically active but dead cells. Cell senescence is one of the main hallmarks of aging, but there are no human clinical trials on senolytics yet. Number 11 spot include advisatin, which is another senolytic compound. However, the recent interventions testing program study found that advisatin didn't extend lifespan in mice. Number 12, kidney transplantation, which is interesting again. You're basically replacing a diseased or injured kidney for a healthy kidney, which would again improve your general health if you have kidney disease. Number 13, true lacta supplementation, which is a supplement that contains human milk bionutrients obtained from human donors. So it's basically a breast milk supplement, which is the first time I'm hearing about it. And I guess milk proteins and milk fats can have some immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects. Number 14, you had h again, but after that, it's smoking cessation. That's interesting as I would have predicted it to be much higher. However, this is where it's important to differentiate between a reduction in epigenetic age and a reduction in the risk of all-cause mortality. Smoking cessation can reduce all-cause mortality risk by over 60% within 30 years of quitting. So for determining how long a person is going to live, smoking is a very important thing. Number 15 and 16 were a vegan diet and a green Mediterranean diet, which is more plant-heavy. Vegan diets haven't seen to result in lower epigenetic age than omnivorous diets. However, they also tend to result in lower calorie intake, which typically is accompanied by weight loss. Calorie restriction and innovative fasting themselves had no effect on epigenetic aging in this particular study, and an omnivorous diet had no effects either. So here are the remaining interventions that resulted in small decreases in epigenetic age. Ketamine, regular Mediterranean diet, copaiba oil, supplementation, low-fat diet plus no exercise, low-carb diet plus no exercise, and healthy guidelines diet. 
Moving on with the interventions that had no effect on epigenetic age, and these are quite surprising. Omega-3s, lavender oil supplementation, B12 plus folate, low-fat diet plus exercise, exercise alone, calorie restriction or intermittent fasting, low-carb diet alone, low-carb diet plus exercise, omnivore diet, rapamycin dose 1, MOFs or monomeric and oligomeric flavanols. You would have probably expected exercise and rapamycin to result in lower epigenetic age, but they didn't. And this is where it's also important to differentiate between the epigenetic age score and the total lifespan and the risk of all-cause mortality. How long a person is going to live is greatly determined by whether or not they get heart disease, Alzheimer's or cancer and when do they get it. To live a long life, you want to delay these diseases as much as possible and ideally avoid them altogether. Regular exercise extends your life expectancy by up to 7 years. You can't say the same for things like arthritis therapy or anti-TNF therapy at the moment. So although exercise didn't result in a reduction in epigenetic age in this analysis, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't make you live longer. Like I said, the average person's lifespan is greatly determined by whether or not they get heart disease and when do they get it. And exercise is one of the most powerful things for reducing the risk of heart disease. And the reduced risk of mortality and greater life expectancy is by far more beneficial than a lower biological age score, especially when the technology of biological age testing is still with its shortcomings. For example, biological age scores rise during inflammation in infections and possibly from excessive exercise. However, they drop down to normal after recovery. So it seems to me that based on this analysis, the epigenetic age clocks are very sensitive to inflammation. The most effective interventions for reducing epigenetic age in this study were arthritis therapy and anti-TNF therapy, which are all very intense anti-inflammatory interventions. I would find it very hard to believe that a regular person without arthritis and without high inflammation would see similar benefits. The same with gastric bypass surgery. It was seen to lower the epigenetic age score quite a lot. But to get gastric bypass surgery, you would have to be obese. For a normal weight person, gastric bypass is probably more dangerous than beneficial. It could also be that the studies are based on the difference in epigenetic age scores from the beginning to the end of the intervention. If you have arthritis, your epigenetic age is probably going to be much higher than normal because of the arthritic inflammation. Then, after arthritis therapies, your inflammation goes down, which creates a big before and after effect. So there can be some selection bias because regular people are not the ones who would get arthritis therapy. To get arthritis therapy, you probably have arthritis. When it comes to diet, exercise and supplements, then the effect can't be that great because the people prescribed these interventions don't have a chronic inflammatory disease in most cases. So going from a semi-normal epigenetic age to normal gives a small effect size compared to going from hyperinflammation to normal. Rapamycin having no effect on epigenetic age is also interesting because rapamycin is the most successful pharmaceutical in extending lifespan in animals. The longest life extension in animals ever recorded is seen with calorie restriction. 65% greater life extension in mice. Rapamycin has reached almost equal results. And it's done so repeatedly. So, just because rapamycin didn't decrease epigenetic age in this analysis, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't extend lifespan because it's already been shown to do so in animals. Obviously, there are no human studies showing that rapamycin would extend human lifespan, but rapamycin probably has the greatest likelihood of doing so as of now. So the name epigenetic age clock can be a bit misleading in this context because it doesn't appear to have that much to do with biological age, but with the inflammation status of the body. Inflammation is a part of aging, but inflammation can also rise acutely, which theoretically would mean that during an infection, you're biologically older. And the same happens in pregnancy, for example. Let's move on with the final interventions, the ones that resulted in negative effects on epigenetic age, meaning that they increased epigenetic age. They include buckwheat extract supplementation, semaglutide, folate, rapamycin dose 3, dazatinib and quercetin senolytics 2, folostatin gene therapy, high pressure hyperbaric therapy, and kidney dialysis. As you can see, there are some inconsistencies with these findings, as some of them were previously seen to lower epigenetic age such as HBOT and senolytics. When it comes to kidney dialysis, then that makes sense because it's done for people with advanced kidney disease. Folostatin gene therapy is interesting. It's basically supposed to increase muscle growth by suppressing a pathway in the body called myostatin that suppresses muscle growth. It might be that the gene therapy itself causes inflammation, which then increases epigenetic age, or it might have to do something with muscle growth itself. I don't think we have that much data about gene therapy to answer that. All right, let's look at the summary. Here's an overview of what type of intervention had the greatest impact on epigenetic age and its pharmaceuticals by a long shot. Lifestyle was second and medical procedures were a close third. Regular supplements had the lowest effect. Pharmaceuticals having the greatest effect is not surprising because pharmaceuticals are the most effective in reducing inflammation that can't be achieved with diet or lifestyle. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that the pharmaceuticals would be the best for longevity. At least there's currently no 
evidence for that. What I do think is that to see radical life extension in humans and to radically slow down aging, we would need some sort of a pharmaceutical intervention. Regular diet and exercise are just not going to do it. They also looked at biomarkers that correlated the most with epigenetic age, and they were cystatin C, which is a kidney marker, hemoglobin A1C, which is the average blood sugar over the last 120 days, CRP, an inflammation marker, glucose levels, ALP, a liver enzyme, and triglycerides, which are a type of fat in your blood. Looking at the most successful interventions, then it makes sense because they were anti-inflammatory, anti-diabetic, or they improved kidney function. Overall, this study is interesting and exciting because it brings together such a massive amount of data on epigenetic age interventions. However, like I said in the video, I think the tests can be somewhat misleading and I don't think that they actually measure epigenetic age. They seem to be correlating mostly with inflammation and blood sugar levels. Especially if you use something like arthritis therapy or anti-TNF therapy. As far as I'm aware, then arthritis therapy hasn't been proven to extend lifespan in otherwise healthy animals, not to mention humans. Likewise, rapamycin not reducing epigenetic age, while at the same time being the most successful pharmaceutical for life extension in animals, is also confusing. Is the goal to live longer or to have a lower biological age score? I would argue that it's to live longer, regardless of what your biological age score says. Now, in most cases, it probably will be that to live longer, you would also need to have have a lower biological age. It's just that the currently we don't have the most precise technology to measure the biological age or we don't have the best perfect concept about it. I recently made a video about the most successful molecules that have extended lifespan in animals in the interventions testing program. Check out that video next. Also check out my new book The Longevity Leap that walks you through 24 chapters on all different aspects of aging and longevity. You'll learn about the fundamentals of a healthy lifestyle such as nutrition, exercise, blood work and supplements. Get The Longevity Leap from Amazon. Other than that, thanks for watching this video. Make sure to click a like and subscribe for future videos about living longer and staying healthier. My name is Seem. Stay optimized, stay empowered.